All right, folks, welcome. This is the organizing behind bars, former prisoners, and the family members of current prisoners telling their stories. We've got five folks here. I'll let uh, each of them introduce themselves as we go, or say a little bit about themselves biographically um, as we go. You know, we have um, Carrie Ann, Bipolar, Chandre, Mark, and Lewis here. Um, do y'all, uh, what we were thinking is just giving each of y'all 10 or 15 minutes to tell some of your stories and share some of your experiences, and then we can open up some questions and answers at the end. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that is really dying to start it off, or there's an order okay. y'all with like speaking. Um, otherwise, we can maybe just start at the end with Terry and, uh, and, and work our way down the line. Okay. All right. My name is Carrie Ann Boucher, and I am Leonard's niece. Uh, my mother my, is the young, one of the younger sisters of Leonard, and I'm also the uh, co-director of the committee, which since Leonard's been in prison, he's had a, a, a family member <coughs> d direct the committee, which, you know, give this, give support about his... Um, gets support, tells information about his case and so forth, and, and gets the public to be involved and so forth. But um, I'm, I came from Fargo, and um, in regards to family history and what we've all gone through, I mean, I'm his niece, and I've always known about it. You know, I grew up with it, but, uh, and we've always, been te you know, we've told people, I've told my friends, this and that, but um, I didn't really get involved until I was uh, in my early 30s to where I became the, the director. And um, with, uh, in Fargo, North Dakota, where he was convicted, and in North Dakota alone, um, being a Native American, and see, I'm, I'm Native American and French, but, uh, so I, I kind of can, I, I get by with a lot more things than, the, than my cousins because they're all full blood native. Um, and my uncle, of course, but um, dealing with the family and being Native American, they have um, been stereotyped, they've been uh, bullied, they've been thrown in jail, um, where my uncle Leonard was was convicted in Cass County in Fargo, North Dakota. His brother was also murdered in that same jail, um, basically saying because he is Leonard's, he's Leonard's family member. Um, most of his children have been bullied by their local policemen. Um, and, you know, had, they've all had issues of some sort or another with, uh, with depression, um, drugs, alcohol, some of them. And, uh, but at the same time, at the same time, um, they've had massive, massive support by people that care about, uh, about rights, about human rights, civil rights. And so that has uh, kept them going and kept Uncle Leonard going, is the hope that he has that one day, you know, he, he'll be free. Of course, it's been 40 years. He, um, Clinton, he was promised basically he'd be out. He had all his his bags packed. He was ready to get out. And the family members, we were all at home waiting, waiting, waiting. And midnight comes around, and he didn't get out. Didn't hear anything. And of course, Obama. You know, I'm, me personally, I'm mad at Obama right now because uh, what he did, he didn't sign the clemency for Leonard. Um, and what Obama did was he signed no. So now Leonard has to reapply for clemency. But we were all thinking that we really seriously thought he was going to get out. The family members really believed that Obama was going to get him out. <coughs> and th so that was another blow. Um, 1985, I believe, when they found the ballistic evidence that proved that the bullets did not come from his gun, he had a court hearing in um, Bismarck, and everybody believed that he'd get out then. So the 85, that was 13 years. Clinton, I think that was 20, 20 years in prison, and today 40 years, and each time is, he's been denied. Um, and so in regards to the family members, we always have this hope, and we really, 
you know, most of, a, most of the family members will um, vote for presidents based on what they'll do for Leonard. And that's the, only, that's the only thing that we care about. I mean, in regards to the presidency in our family is, you know, uh, we're gonna vote for this person because we believe he'll free Leonard. And, uh, and so we're, we're always hopeful, always hopeful, and then it just seems like, boom, we get shot down, boom, we get shot down. And Leonard has been shot down so many times, so many times, um, but he still keeps his spirits, he still keeps his hope, and um, he's got a sense of humor. He continues to, uh, he, he's not giving, he doesn't give up whatsoever. He just does not give up. And he's been in there 40, 41 years, which is, you know, I'm, 40, I'm 45. And so that's like practically my whole life. Um, so in regards to organizing, you know, the family has, like I said, somebody in the family has always been part of the committee. Um, we do as much as we can in regards to letting the public know. We have support groups. The committee has support groups throughout the world. And each, you know, we have some in San Francisco. We have some in Paris, France. And, and everybody in their area will have events and just give some literature and talk about Leonard and his case and where he's at. Um, Mentally, physically, you know, because he's been, he's in, he's in Coleman right now, Florida. And that prison, it's uh, maximum prison. He's 72. He's with a bunch of gangs in this, in this prison. Um, and apparently they're, they, they got a whole new system in the um, federal prison system right now where they're pushing a lot of the gangs here and, and they're almost doing it, um, they're sending them over to Coleman and certain spots where they're almost doing it to where it creates, it creates infighting and all this and that. And so uncle has been in lockdown, which is the longest that I can ever remember, is for four weeks. The whole prison's in lockdown. And they're out right now, he got out Tuesday or Wednesday, and he's only gonna be out for a few days, so I'm gonna go visit him tomorrow. I would've stayed all weekend, but uh, they're going to, Put him, put the prison back in lockdown again on Monday, for most likely a month. They're saying, mm -hmm. and um, and there's a lot of reasons for doing it. I don't know. Apparently, funding. Uh, they want to get rid of some certain inmates. Uh, you mean like you know have them murdered basically? And so they the prison will organize where this person's going to be and that person's going to be. And that's a whole other story in regards to the whole the gangs in there and everything. But um, anyway, so so with Leonard, we're, the family is always there for him. Of course, his family, his friends are, are there for him in regards to uh, having the committee always going, put, you know, standing up for, for rights, human rights, native rights, civil rights, um, and justice. And he didn't, you know, he obviously didn't get a fair trial if people read the story on him. Um, but anyhow, I will help my uncle Leonard for forever, to, for my whole life, um, and I do hope that he does get his justice. The whole family does. So, but I think that's that's about it. Me. Bipolar, um, like I'm an organizer in Seattle. Um, right now, I organize with like Rising Tide as well as um, High Gods Entertainment, and I've been part of a lot and uh, Block the Juvie. I've been a part of a lot of stuff, but how I got started actually was because I got politicized in prison. I remember um, I was like 19 and 18, actually selling dope, trying to make a living, not really having many options. And lied to me in prison, specifically a federal prison. And um, then I'm doing two and a half years there. And it's really <clears throat> one of the things I want to like uh, touch on is the barriers to organizing and how the prisons really look like from the inside. Because I think a lot of times people don't really understand like what it, what the reality of the situation is. Um, 
because they do use tons of manipulation and t- intentionally putting people in cells with people to get them killed. That's not that's not fake. That happens. That's a normal thing. Um, as well as like, if you ever hear about like the heroin problem within prison, that is brought in by the SIS, which is like the gang unit that like speaks and, and talks to all the shot callers of the gangs, which is how they run the prison, right? They have shot callers for certain gangs or the heads, and then they will give them tobacco, heroin, and other things to be able to distribute, to be able to make money off of. And of course, the guards get a cut of that, and the, now it's the high-ranking guards, like a low-ranking guard would probably get busted for it, you know what I mean? But like the, but like the ones that work, the, the gang unit itself is very like problematic in the way they handle it. And also, it can literally get people killed. Like if you piss off the gang unit, that can like get people killed because then you're affecting the flow of drugs into the system, which affects like not only like, and I don't want to demonize people that are like, in the gangs, because what it is is they're using a manipulation tool because a lot of people are sending money out to their family. They're trying to take care of their family from inside of prison. And that's one thing that nobody like usually, like recognizes a lot of times because that happens a lot. People try to like people who are hustling inside of prison are hustling for a reason, not just doing it for themselves. They're not you can't only buy so much in prison. You know what I mean? You get like there's like a like you're not really gonna have a lot. Um, um, one of the things that I see like people on the outside do a lot is like feel like you can just be like rebellious and then, and then I'm glad people want to be like fuck the prison fuck the guards but in the reality of the situation once you get in there the, the world changes drastically like I am completely fuck the pigs all the time but like honestly when I'm in prison or jail I keep my mouth shut about that like not to people but I'm not telling the guard that I'm not in the situation because they will beat you and they will put you down like for example even there was a situation I remember when I was going through and I was getting politicized this time because I was like I thank Bill Clinton for taking away the colleges in prison. I would be a liberal right now if, I, if he wouldn't have done that. If I would have been able to get a college education, I wouldn't have read the books that I needed to read to be able to change my perspective and see this society and this government for what it is. You know what I mean? I would have just went to college, I would have got a degree in there, and be like, I'm going to make the best of my time, and got out and just been a liberal, which is, I'm so glad I could see the world for what it is. But the thing was really clear, and there are certain things that I remember stood out to me. Um, there's one point where I was literally like selling vegetables, right? And a guard, uh, it was a captain, actually snatched it out of my hand and like talked to me sideways and I snapped on him. When they went to, sh- to me to the shoe, they're not supposed to literally have you sewed up when you're in solitary, right? But the feds do that. They put you in two, and sometimes three people into a, like, into one small-ass room, the uh, size of most people's closets with a shower inside it. Um, and so there's a bottom bunk and a top bunk, and on, um, there's one on the floor. So that happens. And then I ended up going to shoot a second time because that ended up making us have three people in the cell. And I was like, I'm never doing that again. Like, I don't want to have two people in the cell like, like, unless I can get out of that cell because that's just really brutal. Like, it's, it just builds hostility between each other because there's not enough room for people to live in, right? But when I went back, I was like, I'm, gonna take a, I'm not taking a celly. Like, I'm just not. You can figure out somewhere to put me. So what they did is they put me in a, a brick room, like, with a brick block. And that block... I had, there was no bathroom, there was no toilet or nothing. Left me there for three days and put like a plastic bag underneath it. And like there was no access to water. The only thing I could drink is the spoiled ice milk they give you every, every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't say this to be like, oh, poor me or whatever. I say this because this isn't unusual. This is like a normal thing. If you buck at all, they're going to do against you. And uh, one of the things was being able to sit back. After, after that experience specifically, I just sat back and shut my mouth and just read. Like I, I drew things and I read and I read and I read. And I also observed how everything was a control system in there. Television, a control system. You don't do what they want you to do, they cut off the TVs. TV is there to only touch the reality outside of prison. Like you don't really, you get a couple letters and you get television. And so when it takes away from people, it completely changes the vibe. People get extremely hostile, extremely upset. And whoever it is that they were mad about, is live look at their ass whooped at least you know what I mean because the thing of these televisions I don't know how to explain it some people have always been out right but like when you don't have nothing but gray walls and other people that are very pissed off to be there look at and some police and you don't have anything else to do but stand there and work their labor their jobs that they pay you 20 15 to 25 dollars a fucking month to work and you're working eight hour days so like those corny ass jobs and then eating horrible food, which by the way says like straight up not for human consumption on the yards. If you live, if you work in the kitchen, people talk about it all the time. It's not made to actually feed anybody else but prisoners. Um, 
And like, there is the medical attention. Well, yeah, it's, you're better off just drinking water and hoping it goes away. You know what I mean? It's just like they're gonna make you worse, they're not gonna make you better. And that's um. And those are like big impacts on like how you live daily within prison. Like, and the thing is like, especially when you get to the federal prison. The amount of time some people are looking at, like never going home, and it's like literally usually for dope, for trying to like pay bills. You know what I mean? Like now, is dope a destructive communities? Absolutely, just like alcohol and tobacco. So it's just really ironic that like they throw our people away for centuries, like literally three, four hundred years. You're never going home, so that you can't even if you appeal, get time knocked off. You only get a hundred years knocked off. You still got three of them, and so you're never going home. And it's like. The federal system is like notorious for that. Like, one of the things that I I wasn't like lucky enough to have like political organizing within prison. All I had was the books I was reading and the observations I was seeing, and then seeing the control system, seeing how they manipulate us through television, through our food, obviously, through um, lockdown situa situations. Which I mean, they lock you if they lock you in a prison. Like someone got killed at one point. And they lock down the prison for a month. And they just lock you in a cell. And if you, like, um, paper bag sandwich, um, like, meals, every meal for that whole month, and you don't get to get out at all. It's, like, actually worse than shoe. Like, shoe is bad, but, like, you get to get out every once in a while to go to rec or something. You get to, it's, it's not. And, um, oh, yeah, and you get to shower every day because you have a shower in your cell, in shoe. Versus when they lock you down, they let you out every three days to take a shower, which is supposed to be, like, the legal minimum they were allowed to do, right? And then, like... Every three days you take a shower and it's supposed to be five minutes or less and get back out and go back to your cell. That's what a lockdown looks like. Um, but all that said, I don't thank them, but I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for being able to see the reality of it and see the reality of where we're at in society because also one thing that you'll hear a lot about is it breaks down to race real quick. At least along the West Coast. I've heard when you go to the South it's a little different or, or like East Coast different, but like we're on the West Coast it breaks down to different race. And it's used as like also a form of control, and the guards also interact based off of that. And when I was spent doing time, I do this thing where I do laps around the tier. I just watch and watch how these things were like controlling everybody. And I'd read books and I'd read books. And I started like you know started with W. E. Du Bois, ended up with like though I don't really mess with this person as a person. Elder Cleaver, Soul on Ice, and there's a reason I don't mess with that dude because he's not really a good person. He never was. You know what I mean? I'm just real about that. Like, you know what I mean, um, Revolutionary Suicide, uh, Sada Shakur. I started reading book after book, trying to understand, like, what I'm going through and see it because when I was seeing and picking up things, I was picking up things that were based just off prison and was and those books specifically. And that's why I'll please, if you support people, send them as any books they want because those books help make me see the contrast between our reality out here and what was in the prison and see how it's really just a microcosm of everything else. Um, then I was in there for two and a half years and got out. Um, and this is where I think I'm going to transition to talking a little bit about like what it is to come out as like an ex-con. Um, and then uh, how it is to, uh, once you actually get politically active. So it came out, there was like really not much. You know what I mean? There, was, there isn't like things, they said there's all these things that you can do to get, there's all these work sources stuff. Those things don't get you jobs. You'll get trained to work, for example, I got trained to get to work as asbestos. No, I didn't get any job doing that. I just got to spend a week in a class to then not have it be able to be usable. And so then they try to act like people aren't trying or ain't building. Well, we're watching our whole communities be taken away. Everybody we know being took back. And you're trying really hard to take back. And then you're left with these choices of, like, either intentionally or, from my case, unintentionally, kind of distance yourself from people. And, like, me, it was unintentional because I started getting political. I went back for violation. I came out. And I started, and then me and my sister started Seattle Cop Watch. And so when that happened, I started going more into political realms. And at first, it was really connected, but the gentrification kept going. Like, it pushed people away. And so I kept staying in the same place because of my political connections, because I didn't have the resources to really be there. Still don't, but because of my political connections, I was able to get into certain spaces or find cheap rent or get supported or things like that when everybody else was getting pushed out and staying in the same place. But then that also unintentionally ended myself way far away. And like people, and luckily people still respect me. Like people still like have love for me, and that's like I feel blessed by that because I've been so distant for last, last year. But that was a big thing. And also one of the things that I noticed is when we're politically organizing, people use our struggle, like our actual struggle, 
to further their own agenda and don't prioritize the people that are actually living it. Which so that's why more people don't come into that struggle. It's not because people don't care. Not everybody says like like oh, all these ex-cons are apathetic. That's not true. There's hella that aren't. And like literally just don't feel like they have a stake and then, then they'll end up being proud of somebody like me because there's not enough room for them, though it's our struggle. Though it's like we're living that struggle. That thing's not going away. And it's things that and it, it tends to be bring patterns of like tokenization. But the importance of having ex cons at the forefront and not also to be clear and to be also accountable myself, not just men either. To be very clear, like, because there's two sides to this incarceration system, really <laughs> extremely bad. And not just cis people either, because, um, be real, nobody goes through like, like a trans woman in prison. That's, like, that's some real shit. Like, there's nobody that's going to get it as hard. That's just, it's just the way it is, because the system set up to, like, completely well, be abusive. Um, but when you put that at the forefront, we see where we need to go to get liberation. When people don't put that at the forefront, it becomes a theory, an idea, but never is tangible. And one of the things that's really important when we go forward, and what I took a lot of time doing, because I put a lot of time, energy, in trying to stop things. And that's important, stop things. But also trying to build things that will actually help our communities is 100% what needs to happen. And it won't happen if we don't put people that are literally defected at the forefront of the situation. Because we know what like our needs are. We know what like our communities are going through. And when it's people outside of it that, I mean, I'm not saying people don't have their heart in the right place, but, but don't prioritize that, it ends up divided from that and it becomes, like this is what happened in my city at least, there's these people over here, they're fighting it, they have no connections to anybody living it. And they're fighting it for what? They argue against things, but they never argue for things. They never try to build things, they never try to build connections or networks with people living it. Instead, they're like trying to be the activists. And we got, it feels like we gotta avoid that and realize it because it, <coughs> In my experience, there's been a lot of energy put into that type of organizing and very little energy. And like also who gets supported too. Like who gets supported are people that are academics, that have degrees, that have things. And a lot of the people who take the, put their neck on the line are the people that don't have shit. And why is that? Um, it's, it's not an easy road like in being in these situations. Um, it's not an easy road to walk. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen that don't happen to other people. For example, I mean, just gonna. I know I'm just hopping around. I'm not doing it chronologically, but um, in 2015, there, for example, uh, literally on my friend's birthday, uh, the state tried to have me killed for the second time, very directly, like an assassination type attempt, where someone had approached us that had a gun, was trying to verify my like legal name, and I wasn't giving it to them, and. Uh, they were still like a little nervous to do it because they obviously weren't directly a cop, but like, to how we know it was the police is because twice, that early that morning, where police followed one of our, our friends from our house, 60, and then once at one o'clock where they were surveilling the house, and then this person pops up when we walk out of the alley like they already knew we were gonna be there, looking at us like boom, and knowing my legal name, which I don't tell people. <laughs> um, and then priorly was actually because of cop washing, which really had a group of people attack me on camera, and then I got arrested. Then the court case, a few people who were here for that, ended up me getting tased in the back of my hands up because I called it as a fascist. Because um, it's a fascist, and it was one of the most racist trials. Literally, the only thing that was different from, like, honestly, um, uh, uh, not UE, but, uh, uh, uh what? No, 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 let's see. Oh uh, yeah, Bible seal, sorry, yeah. Um, was that I wasn't tied to a chair. But the, the, besides that, the trial was just as ridiculous. Like literally had people set five feet apart, like they couldn't speak to each other, like they were starting to detain every person there. They were like dismissing every black person that came on the jury immediately because uh, because they were black. Like it was not even like it wasn't like I'm literally on appeal right now because the bad challenge for that. Um, these things that don't happen to like academics but that the academics will get way, way more support. And, and I'm using my life example because it's my business to share. This is not the only example. It's far from the only example. Like, I don't want to share anybody else's business though. You know what I mean? So it's, again, I said I'm not going chronologically. So the thing is like, how do we build past that? It feels like one of the ways we build past that, I mean, this is the first step, but then literally like taking time to network and, and build and listen to me. Okay. Um, 
and listen to the people most affected, to let, let, get involved with people most affected. And I hate the phrase most affected to clarify because it just sounds so thing, but it's, 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 a real, it's a real situation that doesn't feel like it's emphasized enough. It doesn't feel like that put enough energy to it because it's going to take a lot to, to beat this prison system and to beat like the toxicity of it. Because like, another thing I didn't really mention because I'm trying to like, cram a whole bunch of information at once was there were people dying from cancers and tumors in prison. Straight, you could see the tumors. Like it wasn't cool and they didn't get treatment. These things are both environmental as well as racist, sexist, homophobic, and genocidal, most of all. So, um, yeah, um, <coughs> now what I do is I'm an artist that organizes against prisons and not just art as in I make art, which I do, but like how do you use that art in direct action? moving forward against them and how did you use that to also gain resources to build up your community um, so yeah I think I'll stop there I, really, I, I just wanted to say I really want to thank you you know for sharing just because um, I'm a mom of a prisoner and I go around and talk you know what I mean I talk about what's happened to him but when you have the person right there that can tell you what's really happening on the inside, that makes it even more real, you know, to the public. So I just wanted to say that. Um, my name is Chandra Delaney, and I came in from Pittsburgh. I'm with the Human Rights Coalition, Fed Up, the Abolitionist Law Center, and the Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike. Um, like Ramona said, I also am a revolutionary. Uh, not that I wanted to be a revolutionary, but I was forced to become a revolutionary. That's, that, that's what happens in this system. That's, you know, that's how life happens. Um, my son became incarcerated at the age of 18. Um, I figured his sentence was 5 to 20, which is a whole other story. But um, I figured he would do five years at the most, and he would be home. But at about two years in, he started writing me and telling me um, like some of the stuff that was going on in there. And he had, by the, when he first came in there, he, I just started sending him books like he was saying he was reading a lot. I've kept my son's mind active reading books and reading books about everything, about everything about life, about himself, about our black history, which he never got a chance to learn. And once he became more self-aware, he began um, standing up for himself and standing up for others, and he became politicized. Um, he, in about 2001, um, after 9-11, after they, they really started messing with him because he had been getting um, newspapers like The Final Call, and the um, the five percenter um, newspaper, I can't remember the name of it, but he started fighting because they were keeping a newspaper saying that they were racist, and um, they, that's when they really like started going in on him, and he ended up getting in a fight with another inmate, and he got thrown in the hole, and once he got in the hole, that's when the torture began. My son ended up staying in the hole for 10 years. He, he was unable to uh, be paroled because when you're in solitary in Pennsylvania, you, you can't get to see the parole board. So he was in, per, in um, solitary for 10 years. During that time that he was in solitary, he was, he was still fighting. He wasn't, he wasn't laying down. And I guess that's a lot of the reason why they kept him in there. Um, I mean, for the whole 10 years, my life was anxiety 24 hours a day because I was getting letters from my son and other people telling me um, the different things that they were doing to my son. He had been starved so bad to the point where he lost 20 pounds. Um, he had been thrown down a flight of stairs. They, they would, you know, you would, you're supposed to come out for shower every so often. 
Um, and so they would, they would not let him have a shower for like a very long period of time. And then when he would come out, they would attack him. And so he basically ended up like not hardly going out of his cell. And, and when he started um, filing lawsuits and complaints, they started following him around with a camera. So as to, you know, show that they're not doing anything to him, but what they don't tell the court or whatever is that when they want to do something to you, they just turn the shit off, you know, and they do whatever they, they want to do to you. So he was still getting assaulted and, and beat up. Um, let's see, uh, there's, just, there's just so much. Um, he ended up, uh, well, during, this, during that time, I had, that's when I really became like, at first I, I was scared because I didn't, I didn't understand all the stuff about prison and I didn't really know what to do. I went from being scared to being angry and I just started hassling anybody in the government, in that prison, in um, like my local government, my state government, Department of Justice, everybody, I would just start bugging them to death. And what I found out is that when you send a letter to anybody in the government, it don't matter who, DOJ, whoever, they take the same letter that you sent them and send it back to the prison, for the prison to police themselves, just like they, they do to the police out here. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, you know, they, they kind of say that they have no jurisdiction over the state prisons, but somebody has to have like some type of control, you know, over these prisons. Um, at one point, um, my son ended up getting a piece of glass in his food. They were like putting stuff in his food, uh, piss urine, I mean, piss feces, I mean, whatever, I don't know what type of people these are that you know, have the time to sit there and do such you know, stupid, foul things. And I had been and writing and calling and faxing the um, superintendent over the prisons in Pennsylvania, who's now the superintendent over the prisons in California, Jeffrey Beard. Mm -hmm. And when my son had the glass in his food, I said, look, you already know what's going on. I'm calling you every day. Um, get my son out of there, because you know they're trying to kill him. And he agreed, and he moved my son to, to um, SCI Dallas. Mm -hmm. And once my son got to Dallas, I wrote to Dallas, and I called up there, and I said, you guys know my son, by that point, he had been in there like maybe seven, seven years. And I'm like, well, you guys know that it's the guards. You know it's the record of everything that's going on. And it's not my son, it's the guards. Why don't you give him a chance? He's at a new place. Let him out the hole met him in population, and they did. And um, he was out in population, and I finally got to see him, and that's when I saw that he had like lost so much weight because I hadn't seen him in all this time. I never talked to him on the phone. The only thing we were doing were writing letters, so I didn't, you know, I had no idea. Um, and when I did see him, he, he was like so skinny, you know, and he's six foot, he's like, six foot one, I think, and he is like a twig, you know. Um, he was out the hole for like three months. Three months, he goes out to the yard, he comes back in, the guards had ransacked his um, stuff. They call it a contraband search, but it wasn't a contraband search. What they do, if you're a person who files lawsuits, first chance they get, they go through your stuff and remove evidence against themselves. And so that's what they did. So he, they knew he was going to report it. So they made up a fraudulent misconduct and they put him back in the hole. So once he got in the hole there, he um, was back there with, with other guys who were like-minded like him who did the same type of things. The guys were jailhouse lawyers. My son had, he, he took, he wasn't like reading like novels and stuff like that. He was reading law books trying to figure out a way to get you know his situation better and he ended up being like one of the best lawyers Joe Austin lawyers in in the state I mean several lawyers have told me that if your son was out here he would be working with me you know and also they said when he does come home you know he got a job so 
I mean, he's that good. Um, I, don't, I don't think everybody was in on the, but he called a little while ago and he was just telling, you know, about um, some of the stuff that had happened to him. And um, I was telling everybody that he was involved in a case where he was charged with riot. If this was happened at SCI Dallas, um, because of all the stuff that was going on the starvation, he watched them go uh, prisoners into suicide and he actually was a witness in a case that he was going to testify about a prisoner that they had um, caused to create suicide. The family sued the prison and they won money and so for that reason they were really like angry with my son and also for the fact that my son and like everybody, I work with the Human Rights Coalition, what we do, prisoners write us and they tell us everything that's going on and they give us permission to share it with the public. So um, some of our uh, students took all the information we had and they made a 93 page report of all this stuff that was happening to the prisoners and this is just for one year period of time and this is just in one unit, one little unit so I don't really know how many people's in a unit, maybe about 20, I don't know. But in this one little unit, they were doing all this stuff to people. And we shared this, we did a judiciary um, hearing, and we also went to um, the, the Senate hearing in um, D.C., and the prison found out about the report, and they read the report, and they started, a, they like did a rampage and tortured everybody in that unit one by one. And by the time they got to my son, they held a peaceful protest. And they were, um, you know, they end up being beaten very badly on video and charged with riot for merely covering up their, their cell window. In solitary, all you have is a little window. You can't hurt anybody because you can't even come out the cell until you put your hands out, get, you know, get your hands. Then they put your feet together. You can't assault anybody. So they try to act like, you know, they were dangerous or whatever, assaulted them, charged them with the riot. Took seven years, seven years of going to court. The guys defended themselves. Uh, two, last year, the last three of them got exonerated of the riot, which included my son. They went back to court. Well, after that, they decided that they was gonna charge my son. He, my son was the last man standing. They decided, okay, we're gonna charge him with six counts of assault. So they decided to take him back to court. He just went to court in March and he beat his too. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I just think it's important for everybody to know that we must fight. Mm -hmm. We have to fight. We, we can't, like, you can't be no punk. You, we we got we to gotta get up. We got to stand up. If you got a family member on the inside or a friend or anybody, you know, we got to fight for these people because these people are behind enemy lines, number one. And they are, you know, they're trying to wreak havoc on people's lives merely because a lot of these people on the inside are people that have found knowledge of themselves, and they're helping one another and they're building up one another and they don't want that. They don't want them even to come back out here. I mean, you don't know how many people are sitting behind these walls that have so much knowledge that could be helping us out here. And they got them, you know, back there behind the walls. So I just think that's important for us to fight and just never give up. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm uh, Mark Cook. I spent about uh, 40 years of my life behind bars. I part of my sentences ran from from 653 years to two life sentences, pretty much running consecutive. And you wonder how, how I'm out here. I, I really don't know myself. I have got a lot of support, and they just kind of got scared of me in a lot of prisons. They just figured it's better to have them on the streets than have them in prison. And I'll tell you why. First to start off with, understand I was a kid about 14 years old. Let me get 15 years old. And I broke a, a window in high school. I uh, had a 
first, I'm, I'm autistic. So I have t trouble speaking sometimes. I, sometimes I have trouble hearing, hearing people, what they're saying. So I had an issue about racism in the cafeteria, and I couldn't convey it, so I just threw this milk bottle through a window. In those days, they gave kids uh, milk in little, little glass bottles. They didn't have the paper cards they have nowadays. But, and I just threw it, and it just went through a window. Breaking that window resulted in my being brought before a juvenile court. My mother uh, ra was raising eight kids. I'm one of the eight kids. And I figured that that judge figured, well, she, she can't handle this. She's got too many kids to handle. The only way to handle this kid is to put him in a mental hospital. Now, this is the beginning of my life in prison. Uh, I was uh, put in, a, in this uh, uh, mental hospital, and they had an exercise thing where you push this huge wooden block with a blanket underneath it across open floors to polish it three times a day. Every day after meal, you have to push this block. Well, I finally refused to push the block. So they take this 15-year-old kid, and they put him on the ward for the criminally insane. Uh, and in that ward, you sat in a rocking chair. You weren't allowed to speak. You want to go to the bathroom, raise your hand. You could go to the bathroom and come back out. Uh, when, when we showered, we all stood in line, and we'd soap ourselves down in this bathtub, then stand in line to take, wash the, the suds off. In that bathtub, scum that thick was floating around in it. These uh, men had various diseases, among them syphilis. Okay, this was our, our daily shower. There was three of us on this ward, y youngsters, uh, teenagers, decided we couldn't handle this no more. So, well, one of the things that pushed me into doing this is I had to uh, help hold down other patients while I gave them electric sh uh, shock treatments. I don't know if you've ever seen these things. Uh, they are, I mean, they're horrible to watch. Today I know that it was pure torture because they weren't curing these people. And if they had scars on their faces, these scars would blow up like bubble gum on their faces. We'd hold them at their, their uh, shoulders and their elbows to keep them going out of joint while they're doing this. They had a, a, a rubber heel in their mouth to keep them from cracking their teeth from these things. Well, like they were kids, 15, teenage kids, acting as orderlies, holding these uh, patients down, so we figured we're getting out here one way or another. So we made ourselves some shanks, and we were willing to actually kill these guards to get out. But one of uh, us were, was being examined by a, a psychiatrist who used hypnosis. And on this kid, he, he used his hypnosis, so you just clear your mind of all the things that are on your mind, blah, blah, and he came up with the escape plan. This was in Washington State in uh, Northern State Hospital. They shipped us to the Eastern State in what they call the Slaughterhouse, Eastern State Hospital. These are really the, the, the criminally insane, the most criminally insane on three floors, and they stuck us one on each floor. And things, in a sense, got worse. One of the patients decided he would tell the story that we were trying to do an escape in order to, for, so, so he could move to a, a, a less violent ward. I was tortured. They, they uh, put me, stripped me, put me in a straight jacket with my arms like this. Again, I'm still this kid uh, over a, a hospital bed with no mattress on it. They ran a sheet, tied a sheet on one side of the bed, ran it under my arm, behind my neck, down here, and then tied it on this side. They cuffed my feet to the bottom of the bed. When they pulled that sheet, it would raise me up off that bed, and then it beat me in the stomach. Well, I screamed, I cried, and I, I begged for him to stop. <clears throat> and then I, I cussed him out, and I told him, you know, just go ahead. I got more ass than you got leather. I just totally went insane as a kid. That was my first real bout with torture. In, in prison. <clears throat> they took me out there, they, they chained me and put me in bed. I was chained in, chained in the bed for about a week. After that, they had me in, in chains uh, uh, when they put me out in the population with the other uh, patients who were also in chains. This is before they ever had Thorazine. They, some of those people were in chains for decades. 
these are the, like I say, the, the so-called criminally insane. Well, finally, a, a new doctor took over, and he, he ordered them to take everybody out of chains. They're going to try this new Thorazine. The Thorazine, in a sense, it did work. I mean, it's a terrible drug. You look at it today, it's a terrible drug, but back then, it was better than chains, I'll tell you that. Well, that was my experience. I spent three years in, in that hospital going through some of the weirdest crap you ever heard of. And for a kid, they didn't have foster homes. So they put them in mental in institutions. That's what it really amounted to. I got out of mental hospital at about 20, maybe 21 years old. Tried to get a job. Couldn't find any work. Tried to go in the Air Force. They, they classified, said, you're ready for ROTC. But they pushed my papers further and said, no, you were in a mental hospital. You can't even go into service. And so I did what a lot of people do. I couldn't find a job, so I decided to be a thief. I got 20 years, three 20 year terms for being a thief. <clears throat> I went to uh, prison in, was it in, in the uh, reformatory, got in trouble there. They sent me to the, the uh, maximum prison um, penitentiary for men. I was 21 years old at that time. Uh, and while I was there, they had me working in a laundry, and it was racist. They had all the, the blacks and Indians working in the back and all the whites up, on, up front working on the, the main machines like the washers and the dryers, et cetera. We just did the hot head presses in the back. So one day I got, got fed up with this. As I was leaving, going to uh, the, the mess hall, I was the only one in there with my boss, and he was standing by this extractor. Extractors are these huge round things where you put clothes in to wring them out. Well, I just pushed him. He went in the extractor, I hit the extractor, I hit that lid, it came down and I turned it on. And I was walking down the ramp, I was, and I said, no, nah, this is a really bad idea, Mark. <laughs> 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 so I came back and let him out, uh, let the lid up, and I just went, went to the mess hall. And of course, they come to get me out of the mess hall, but he was going around and around trying to get out of it. <laughs> but this, this is, my, this is the, the first time I ever reacted to, to racism, you know, at, at that level. I, I call this the, uh, what do you call it, uh, extreme persuasion. I was putting on him, but I, I just figured that wasn't, that wasn't the time. It'll come later. <clears throat> so they put me in uh, solitary confinement, and I, I don't know how long I was in there, maybe uh, a year, and it's time for me to get a parole board review, and I said, I'm not going. I'm not crazy. I'm not going to waste my time. And they, they came back with a goon squad and dragged me before the uh, pro law pro board. And there happened to be a, a black man on that pro board out of Seattle. And I, would, I wasn't speaking at all. I just refused to say anything. And he says, Mark, I know, I know your mother. Me and your mother went to school together. And so this is the thing that got me out of the hole. But it got me more than out of the hole. He convinced him to pro me. He said he never should have been put in that hospital to start off with. And that just started a chain chain of events. So I was released after doing about five years. Uh, <clears throat> again, I couldn't get a job. I, I did finally come up, come, come, come think of it, I did finally get a job. I got a job working in, in a, a hotel, a major hotel. Got married, had a kid, was getting ready to adopt uh, two more kids. My wife, who was First Nation, she, and she had this uh, what do you call it? The uh, oh, oh, I try to try to remember this thing. Potlatch. She had this potlatch mentality. If she had something and other Indians didn't have anything, she'd give everything we had to them. She just kept doing this by checks. <laughs> <coughs> so I figured I need a little supplemental uh, help here. So I did three more robberies, got busted, three more fifty years, three fifty year terms, a mandatory fifteen uh, minimum. It sent me to the penitentiary. So while I was in, in the pen, penitentiary, I, this is about 1969 or, or so, 68. No, I was in, in a county jail, 1967. And uh, Huey Newton and some Panthers showed up on the steps of uh, the, the Capitol. With, the, with firearms saying, we are the Black Panther Party, we do civil, you know, civil defense for our, our communities. Uh, that impressed me a lot. And then I started reading this stuff, and this other uh, prisoner with me said, hey, let's start a Panther Party. When we got to penitentiary, 
we wrote to uh, Huey Newton and asked him if we could start a chapter of the Panther Party within that prison. And he said, yeah, it was the first prison Black Panther Party ever started in, in a prison. Read George Jackson. Jo George Jackson said, said, do what Mao said. You know, Mao didn't do everything right, but one thing he did say is base your revolution on the conditions that you are living under, not somebody else's, the conditions you are living under. And so using the 10-point program, we applied it to what was happening in that prison. We set up a pretty good Panther Party within that prison. I got involved with a, a couple Canadians. These are white Canadians, one a French Canadian, uh, what's that other guy? Oh, yeah, a Scottish Canadian. And they wanted to start an underground newspaper in the prison. And I, I said, you know, it's not going to work. I've done a lot of time already, and that's not going to work. He says, we, we've got to figure out how we can make it work and how we can do this thing. They'll never know we're doing this underground newspaper. One of them had a, what they call a curio uh, permit to do little jewelry boxes. So he was able to buy wood materials, and he had these a huge piece of glass, a mirror, where he could cut them out and put them in the jewelry boxes. But he didn't cut, it, cut this one up. He used masking tape and did a, a big rectangular square that masked it, in, masked it in. We stole gelatin from the kitchen, boiled it down in our cells with stingers, poured it on this glass, and when it, jet, when it got solid, we'd do typing on the, the back of a, what we call a Ditto Master Papers, some of the older people know what Ditto Master was. We, we'd do it on a, the back of this tape paper, put it on a gelatin, press it down, smooth it, and peel it off. And there was our, our printing press. So we were able to print enough uh, copies to go to 20% of the population, and it spread like a wildfire. We call it the bomb. And, <laughs> but this was my first real... Uh, connection to journalism and how important it is for organizing. We organized that prison. This is the first prison we organized. And we put, only put in there what everybody talked about. It's not, it wasn't about me or, you know, the people who were in there. They never knew who did it. They didn't know whether we were black, white, whether they were, you know, disabled or anything. They just knew what we were putting in there is what they felt. And then we started putting in suggestions how we were going to resolve this thing. It resulted uh, eventually in shutting down the prison. There was other instances that came up where we had to seize the opportunity and had them to shut it down. I said, if you care, grow hair. You weren't allowed to grow any facial hair, sideburns. Your hair had to be a quarter inches uh, or, or less or you'd go to the hole. So everybody started growing hair. That's when it got, looked like a bunch of hippies in there. They had beards and everything. And the warden's getting upset. He couldn't control his prison. So he wanted to call the leadership of the con bosses to see what, what was going on. A con boss is uh, somebody who's been working at a job in a prison a long time, so he gets to select who's going to work on these jobs in the laundry or the kitchen or whatever, you know. And some of the con bosses were athletes. They were the superstars as baseball players or football players. We used to play regular uh, football in, in prison at that time. The, in, and did boxing. Uh, I just happened to be, uh, I don't know, uh, I was in college at the time, so they figured they needed to call a black person up there along with these others. They, they actually called the guys who did the bomb along with some others up there. And he, they said, well, what can we do to settle this thing that's going on in prison? He said, well, we started giving suggestions, you know, and uh, somebody in uh, the Capitol said, get them to write out a constitution or something to let us know what it is. We wrote a constitution, and we asked for the moon. And we, we give it to them, and the warden says, no way. And the people in the Olympics said, no, no, they're going to have to water this thing down. They sent it back to us. We did another one. No, the first one we, we did, we told the uh, population that the, the guys who wrote the constitution, which was us, you know, they don't know who we are, are selling you guys out. You burn that constitution. So they went in front of the mess hall and they, they burned the constitution. Uh, and so when we, when we wrote the next one, you know, we had things the way we wanted it. We called it the 50-50 program. The prison could run the security part of the prison. We wanted to run the, uh, what you call it, the treatment and entertainment parts of the program. They said, that's cool. And that was the beginning of my political activism. Learning from uh, the 10-point 
pro program of the Panther Party, and then working with these Canadian revolutionaries, the immigrants, you might call them, they threw in the uh, penitentiary with us. There were six of us. So we had a, one of our immig the immigrants was in for a second degree murder, and we wanted to get him out of there. So we put this plot together. It's called, uh, uh, oh gosh, RGC. Uh, Roberts goes to Canada. His guy's name was Roberts. Okay, okay, three minutes. I'm going to have to speed this up and cut it short. Okay. But eventually, we had got him elected as a president of this new committee, this uh, constitution. Was, and he could go outside of prison, down to minimum security, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, we had somebody go down and pick him up and take him to Canada. So that was, a, that was a, the first successful escape I ever helped with <laughs> in, in, in a penitentiary. Okay, well, okay. But the, that's not the main thing. I mean, the main thing was uh, eventually we were able, to, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff in here, we were able to convince the state to let us have an abandoned women's prison outside of the, the, the main prison. And select people, 15 people, who had more than 15 years to work in this program, we're going to do reupholstery. And we had somebody who, who could go downtown and do sales and bring in customers from the state, federal, and local agencies who wanted reupholstery done. So we had this thing going. It was, and we had to get a funding for it. I like to say I'm speeding this thing up a little bit. We eventually got $250,000 to pay for the maintenance of that building and to hire a, uh, one prison guard to call, make a call in to say how many prisoners were there every day. And nobody ran off. It was a, it was a per perfect program. Okay. Uh, the, uh, what is it? the governor came down. Dan Evans of Washington State came down. He looked at the program. He liked it. Somebody in the program convinced him to send me to Seattle to a halfway house. Now, I got a 15-year minimum, and I'm, I'm not qualified for a halfway house. But they sent me to the halfway house. When I got there, the people in the halfway house didn't know who I was. So, but, so eventually, I stayed. I said, let me go home. He said, no, you're going to stay here until we find out who you are. But anyways, <laughs> I, they, they kept me there for one year. And during that one year period of time, they had me go into a, in a work release program in a Seattle Community College. They gave me one hour free time. During that one hour, I went around and I found the student unions. I found the prisoner programs. I found uh, the, the prison pr program like Women Out Now and uh, the, what do you call it, the, uh, the prisoner union, S several people. I went to the uh, American Friends Service Committee everywhere telling them I wanted to put together a conference and I want you people to help me put this conference together, you know, and we'll do a forum one, one time, once a year, and we're going to get prisoners out to come to this conference. We're going to get wardens and we're going to get staff out to come to this prison. We're going to get judges. They said, cool, cool. They, so I'm in the halfway house getting these checks, you know, to fund this thing. <clears throat> but I still have to stay in that halfway house for a whole year. Eventually we did uh, uh, hold a conference. Okay, so I'm going I'm to sk skip over that and get really right down to the nitty-gritty here. George Jackson Brigade. Okay, the, George, the Black Panthers had gone to Seattle to be bodyguards for Elaine Brown in, in Oakland. So I needed to get a program going in Seattle. Uh, and so I got a program similar to what I did inside of the penitentiary with some ex-cons. And we hired ex-cons off the streets, uh, pr people on probation, people in work release, to come and work. We had five different projects to work on with, in, in this uh, project we set up. We called it the Pivot Project. Okay, th th that's going on there, so forget about that. Okay. <laughs> so there's uh, some activism going on in, in Seattle, underground activism, and it's called the George Jackson Brigade. They needed money to fund their, pro their, their project. Uh, there was one instance where in, in Walla Walla where they had uh, prisoners in solitary confinement who were being, being tortured, uh, beaten. There was a lot of things that were wrong, and... They did the general, what we do nowadays, the general persuasion, you know. Please, please, you know, help them out, get them out of the prison, don't do that thing. And the government just ignored them, ignored everything. So we went up and blew up the Department of Corrections in the state capitol. They fired the warden, got rid of some guards, and let them guys out of solitary confinement. And that was my introduction to the George Jackson Brigade. I was told by the, the Panthers in, in uh, Oakland to join the the George Jackson Brigade to find out who they were. 
you'd be surprised who they were. <laughs> LBGT, it's the white folk, it's the Indians, the blacks. And so that was a, I don't know, what you want to call it a culmination of my uh, uh, activism. But we did a lot of bombings in support of uh, workers' rights. Uh, Seattle City Light went, went on strike because women weren't getting the same wages or had the same jobs as men. We did a bombing there, blew out a transformer, electric tra transformer in the uh, uh, rich neighborhood. They got their jobs. <laughs> they got their wages. Okay, so we did a, a lot of actions like that. And, and everyone, this is the two, two books written about it, the U.S. Guerrilla USA and uh, Movement with Teeth, and it details what's going on there. But the, the whole thing was journalism. We put out a, a what you call it, a, a, a kind of a memorandum for everything we did. We pu had it published in the newspapers and gave it to the media, saying why each bombing was done. And this was journalism. We called it armed propaganda. So I I'm going to end right there and just somebody else will speak later on. <laughs> When I say shut them, you say down, shut them. Down. Shut them. Down. So when I begin, I want to say thank you, first of all, to the Fight Texas uh, Prison Convergence. Let's make some noise for that. <laughs> Cindy Spoon. Ron Seifert. And um, the University of North Texas. I want to give a special round of love for the Denton local folks, man. Y'all have showed us a lot of love. Um, Ramona Africa and Move, I'm a huge fan of hers. And um, I want to talk to you about prison to activism pipeline. Is that all right? Yeah. So before I begin, uh, I want to tell a story. I want to tell a story about Cheesy, and I want to tell a story about Dooney. Cheesy was about 40, 40-ish years old. Dooney was about 21. Um, when Dooney ran into Cheesy, Cheesy was a trustee. And if you know anything about trustees, the trustees are the ones that have, have access to stuff, right? And so Cheesy was the guy that stood by the uh, food slot. So when you gave your tray in, he was the guy that kind of scraped it off. And as Dooney was coming down the hallway, Cheesy stopped him and he said, I think I know you. And Dooney was like, you don't know me, right? And uh, he said, man, I really think I know you. And he said, um, I think you killed my oldest son. And Dooney was like, man, I sure don't know who you are, right? <laughs> and so Dooney burns off. And so a couple of weeks pass. And they're eating chow. And Dooney is... Uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've ever seen anybody eat in prison, you understand that it's, a, it's like a contact sport, right? You ain't paying attention, nothing except your food. And Dooney was eating, and Cheesy sat down in front of him. And the whole table just stopped, right? And so Dooney goes to apologize. And Cheesy says, stop. I forgave you two years ago when everything happened, right? And so the reason why I tell that story about Cheesy and Dooney is because I was Dooney. I went to prison at the age of 21 for voluntary manslaughter. The man, Cheesy, was the father of the guy that I killed. And the reason why I tell you about Cheesy is because there's a word that's absent during this whole day, and that word is compassion. Cheesy showed me a level of compassion in a place that was uh, devoid of compassion. He showed me a level of compassion that people lack today when we talk about this thing called mass incarceration. We talk about this prison system, right? And so I did eight years in prison. I did 12 years on parole. And there was no compassion shown from anyone, not the churches, not the communities, not my family, not my friends. So I spent 12 years 
just wallowing in this muck and mire, right, of, of not knowing what to do with my life, not having access. How many of y'all have been to school and have a loan? And how many of y'all had to pay interest on that loan, right? So imagine you've got this loan that you've already paid back and they're still charging you interest on. I call it the perpetual interest loan. So after I spent my time in prison, after I spent my time on parole, I still can't get a job. I still can't get housing in my name. There's still certain funding programs I'm not eligible for, right? So there's this perpetual interest system that still affects us. And so we leave out of prison and we come into this environment of no compassion. As a matter of fact, it's almost like you deserve not to have access. And then when you tie that into our communities, and we realize that our communities have been historically marginalized, historically criminalized, historically penalized, and then you bring the same people that you had no problem getting slave labor from, mm -hmm. but you won't get the job. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I came out not having access. I came out not being connected with anybody that had my background. I came out not being politicized. I came out not even knowing that this thing called mass incarceration existed. All I knew was that I didn't have access. And I didn't have access because I wasn't educated. I didn't have access because I didn't have a good uh, personality. I didn't have access because of something I did when I was 21 years old. I'm 47 years old and I'm still experiencing the reverberations of prison. 26 years later, I am still dealing with the preclusions as if I just went into prison. I just recently got denied for a, a multi-level marketing program because I couldn't pass the background check, right? So it took me 15 years to find this voice I'm using now, right? And the reason why it took me 15 years to find this voice is because there were so many opportunities for people to reach out, but the stigma and shame of saying that somebody in my family went to prison stopped them. The stigma and the shame of the church that came in to visit us wouldn't allow them to accept us when we came home. Right? So January 2015, I ended up in the hospital with uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, I started plea bargaining. I don't know if y'all know about plea bargaining. But I began to make a deal with God. And I said, God, if you let me live, I'll tell my story. Right? And he let me live, so I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my part of it, right? So I put out a book, right, called Change the Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R. And so the reason why I did that was because you can sit around and wait for the weather to change, or you can change the weather. And I didn't want anybody else to go through that 12 years of what I went through. I didn't want anybody else to feel like their voice was stifled. I felt like I was cursed because I took a life, right? I felt like because um, I had gone to prison, I didn't deserve access. And there's so many of us that have come out of prison with that same mindset that I don't deserve anything more than what I'm getting right now, which is nothing. Hmm. Right? So I joined an organization called Reentry Advocacy Project. And it was the first time that I got exposed to people who were activated, who had been to prison. Matter of fact, one of the people were the ones that now is why people with drug convictions can get food stamps. Because she was a drug addict that couldn't get food stamps and had kids to feed. So she got activated and she took it upon herself to change policy. We started an organization called Second Chance Democrats. The reason for us starting that was to pass Fair Chance Hiring in Austin. It was a formerly incarcerated led movement. And the reason why that's important is because those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. 
If you're having conversations about mass incarceration and folks that have been in prison ain't doing the most of the talking, uh, y'all just having fun. <laughs> right? If we aren't the ones leading that effort, that is an effort just to assuage your guilt. Because if you extrapolate what that is, you realize that the people that are heading up that movement, we're going to operate on morality. We're going to operate on transformation. We're going to operate on equity. Because those are the things that we weren't allowed. So those are the things that we're going to demand. And when we stood before that city council, we didn't talk about cost analysis. We didn't talk about restrictive ways of doing business. We talked about, I deserve a job because I am qualified. I deserve a job because I came in here and applied and you said the job was available. Whatever I did was 21 years ago, right? So we passed this ordinance that said you cannot put a box on the application. You can't do a background check until you offer me a job, right? If you demand transformation upon us, it is incumbent that those employers transform the way they do business and the way they hire people, All right? And so that is what we insist upon, and that's why former incarcerated people have to lead the movement, because it's about transformation. It's about transforming. We call it transformative organizing, that when we get done, it's not going to look the same, right? When we got done with Austin, People have a fair chance at hiring now, right? It doesn't matter what you went to prison for. But then they tried to attack it on the state level. So we started a coalition that was led by formerly incarcerated folks. And I'm proud to say that we killed every attempt to kill fair chance hiring in Texas. And that effort was led by folks that spent time in prison. So we talk about the school to prison pipeline I'm talking about the prison to activism pipeline. I'm talking about getting out of prison and connecting with folks that have your background, folks who are engaged, folks who are activated. I testify in front of the Senate committee. I testify at that Capitol. Every chance I get to tell somebody I went to prison, I tell them, right? Every chance I get to shock somebody, and tell them I did eight years in prison for murder, I do it. Because I want you to change your perception. I want you to change what you think somebody looks for prison looks like. That's why I show up looking like this. <laughs> you understand? It's not an accident. It's purposeful. It's intentional. The same way they intentionally deny us, I intentionally, I'm part of an organization called Texas Advocates for Justice, and we intentionally put folks who are formerly incarcerated in positions of leadership. We create specific vehicles to put people who are formerly incarcerated in positions of leadership. I, as a leader, am not interested in followers. I'm interested in providing a space for other people to be leaders. I'm interested in amplifying the voice of black women. I'm interested in amplifying the voice of trans, LBTGTQI, right? That's what I'm interested in. Because in that power, in that organization, in that connection, lies that transformation. And we're not going to do anything if this system isn't transformed, if these hearts aren't transformed, and if we can't figure out a way to attack this system with love, <coughs> attack this system with compassion, something that they refuse to lose, use, forgive me. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Just saying, we kind of have a special treat. Uh, Kalika here is actually able to call uh, call in someone incarcerated with the Free Alabama movement right now, and uh, yeah, they'd love to share a little experience that they've had. But I'll let you do a little bit more introduction if that's okay. 
Okay, uh, a lot of people here are familiar with the Free Alabama Movement. The Free Alabama Movement, it started like back in 2014. Um, a lot of the men that were in prison, they basically wanted to fight against the horrible conditions that existed inside of the prisons in uh, Alabama. And one of the campaigns that they were fighting was uh, prison slavery. And one entity that we put a lot of focus on was actually McDonald's. Uh, we waged a large campaign against McDonald's. But the Free Alabama Movement is part of a very large interest to lead up to the September 9th prison strikes with Attica Rebellion and so forth. And um, on the line, we have one of the organizers of the Free Alabama Movement when it first started. His name is Ross. Uh, he worked hand in hand with uh, Kinetic, uh, spokesperson uh, Ray, and Dati, and many others. So he's just going to uh, give us a statement on behalf of the Free Alabama Movement. Uh, I just recently spoke with a spokesperson Ray's mother, and they have an actual um, seminar, uh, a seminar coming up on June 24th to support uh, people and give them tips and encourage them to support their people behind the wall. There's a whole seminar, and so they encourage you all today to go to the Free Alabama Movement Facebook page and register for that. It's like a webinar. Register for it, please, and participate. It's, it's going to take you to an Eventbrite page, and you just click on the button for a ticket, and you will be able to attend for free. So on the line is uh, the comrade of uh, people like spokesperson Ray and Kinetic who also extend their love uh, and they're going to be helping to organize towards August the 19th, but they can't be on the line. But we are fortunate to have many soldiers behind the wall who can continue to work. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, but they all been moved around. But he's just going to give an update on the Free Alabama Movement, and his name is Ross. You there, Ross? Okay. You know, as you know, you have we have uh, a similar problem nationwide. Uh, you know, dealing with the uh, 13th Amendment and legalized prison slavery. Okay, you know, from from this, you know, you your first uh, organization, whether it be Free Alabama Movement or, you know, uh, New Underground Railroad or, you know, whatever other uh, uh, organization you have. So the Free Alabama Movement started basically because, you know, you have a real bad, overcrowded situation in the state of Alabama. It was overcrowded by a 200% capacity. And, you know, even though the, the government is telling the federal government is telling them they have to release and alleviate the overcrowding, they basically, they will put a band aid over a wound instead of addressing what the major problem was, meaning that they don't want people to release anyone. And, you know, wherefore you got. <laughs> A situation created that it becomes like inhabitable, in, uninhabitable, uh, extremely violent. People getting robbed, uh, murders happening on a regular basis. So, you know, something had to be done about it. This state makes uh, a license plate tag for a number of different states. They make chemicals for different industrial uh, companies. They do metal fabrication, they do uh, uh, auto, mobile renewal. They're making millions of dollars per year, but they're making millions of dollars off the back of prisoners, okay? And the majority of the prisoners that they're making this money off of are black, okay? From the time when we came up from the plantation, they came up with the convict mixing program. 
where they would arrest people for different vagrancy laws or whatever, and they would lease them out to different companies, like pump wool companies, drill wool companies, whatever. All this was legalized slavery. Then it came with the Jim Crow law, and it legalized slavery. We're still being locked up wholesale. The black community being decimated. Okay? And to this day, it's the same exact scenario. And all of this is done under the guise of the 13th Amendment. And it's so called Emancipation Prequel Proclamation. You know, we, we have never truly been free because of this. So the only way for us to fight these people, you know, outside of uh, just tearing it up and everyone being killed in the process. For the future, can be a little bit harder for everybody else. But it's to hit these people where it really matters. Because the only thing these people have ever cared about is the bottom, bottom line, the dollar. So in 2014, we shut the state down. <laughs> they lost millions of dollars in the weeks that we shut these prisons down. Okay? They couldn't come in with the uh, brutality and in the head and all that because it was a non-violent, peaceful protest. 100% for poor. Because everybody's tired. And like Patty Holmes said, if you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you can suffer about it. Okay. Uh, Free Alabama movement is a collective of uh, Organizing efforts of uh, uh, kinetic justice and you know Melvin Melvin Ray right side. myself, Dr. Khalid, and other individuals that are incarcerated in the Alabama uh, judicial system. I Rod David. I've been incarcerated for a period of 24 years. I should have been out a long time ago, but you know, at some point we become a political prisoner and you know how you know how it works. Uh, you know, I was revolutionized by Richard McCarthy Gray, who is a political prisoner and he was a member of the East Coast Action of the Black Panther Party. You know, we give credit to all the freedom fighters past and present who have stood against. System. What we're doing right now at this moment is bringing awareness as to August 19th and the millions or more parts uh, to Washington and bringing awareness about the 13th Amendment and the effects of the 13th Amendment. The black community has been decimated. Men have been, black men have been locked up wholesale as well as sisters. Okay? They get locked up on trumped up charges and they receive these illegal sentences and it's all based for legalized you know, legalized slavery. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we've never come up from slavery. And this is the form of suicide. When you take the man out of the household and the family becomes completely like destabilized. No man in the household, you have generations and generations and generations of it that have well and still and still well. In September, on September 9th, the anniversary of the Attica Rebellion. Free Alabama movement, along with others, organized the largest prison strike in the history of the United States. We have the ability and the power to do so about this system of mass incarceration. But what it takes is it takes the collective effort of the inside and outside working together to bring awareness to this system and to address this system and fight this system. 
You know, we we have to divest our dollars away from these things. We have to stop using these uh, phones that that the, the companies like Global Carolina are making millions of dollars for every year. We have to stop using these coffee companies, these shoe companies, and all these other companies that 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 uh, are their off of this. Whether it be Victoria's Secret, whether it be McDonald's, the uniform getting made, whether it be uh, Verizon Wireless, ICT, and Bankers, the companies that profit off prison labor have to be identified and boycotted. As well as shut down in this country, these prisons have to be shut down. This is the only thing these people understand. From the time when they colonialized nations in Africa, uh, India, and everywhere else, raising their children to land on this earth, they have always been after the dollar, and that's the only thing they respect. And that has, we have to divest our dollars away from dealing with these facts. Okay. And that's just too fast. Okay, Roger. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, my apologies. Uh, we are about to uh, wrap up, and as I told you, uh, this segment of our program and our uh, conference is about family support uh, and organizing um, behind the bar. So, do you have any suggestions how we on the outside can be more effective or anything particular that we can do in regards to the things that you mentioned that you're working on? Well, the main thing is to bring awareness to uh, about the 13th Amendment because, you know, people just really don't have a complete understanding of what's going on. And they don't understand that, you know, this is a government sanctioned uh, 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 a, 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 a catastrophe that for us, you know, and so I feel the awareness is truly brought about this, you know, it's something that's going to continue going on. Uh, while you're on that stage, I'm going to address the uh, fundraiser for the San Francisco Bay Jews. We're, we're spreading the word on the A5 to, you know, bring people where they can have cards down and flat and you know, different uh, momentum uh, and, and giving thanks to Sister Mary Hill for the work that she's been doing, getting the word out for over 30, over 40 some years. Okay. At the same time, you know, uh, we're collaborating on the inside with all of the uh, prisons in the state of Alabama to, you know, get them to our, our Black August program is going to be on the 19th, okay, in conjunction with tomorrow. There will be no working for August 19th. You know, we will be standing in solidarity and full support. Okay, I'm not working with individuals in different prisons across the country, okay, so we can all be on the same page. Okay. That's, that's excellent to hear. <clears throat> then y'all will uh, not be going to work or anything of that nature on that day. So I don't think a lot of people were aware of that, so I definitely let others know. And maybe we can uh, do an initiative, just like with the strike, to shut down work everywhere possible on that day in solidarity. Right. But um, we really appreciate you for taking the time and uh, calling in during this portion. We're going to get back to work. We'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you